Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Laurent Brochard. I'm working at the University of Toronto, and I'm going to in Canada, and I'm going to discuss today the question of uh, whether we should monitor respiratory effort done by the patient during assisted ventilation. My laboratory has a relationship with the industry for research grants or uh, equipment. So the number one reason why we would uh, wish to, mon to monitor respiratory effort, so spontaneous breathing, is for lung protection. I'm not going to go into details, but we have very strong evidence that at least in a severe lung injury, adding spontaneous breathing on top of mechanical ventilation can worsen lung injury. And this is a nice example, a classical study by Takeshi Yoshida. You see on the left, uh, control mechanical ventilation, airway pressure and esophageal pressure show positive swings indicating passive ventilation. On the right, the same amount of positive pressure plus negative pressure swings generated by the animal. And the total transpiratory pressure in that case becomes much higher than during passive ventilation because you add the amount of uh, negative pressure generated by the patient to the positive pressure by the ventilator. And you see at the bottom uh, a clear example of a worsening of the lung injury, uh, increasing inflammation, etc. So we know that uh, we have to be careful every time the patient is breathing at the same time than the ventilator. In addition, we uh, think that uh, cause of um, worsening maybe what we call patient self-inflicted lung injury, which means that uh, the impaired gas exchange and mechanics uh, stimulate the respiratory drive of the patient. And this respiratory drive increases these negative pressure swings, as I've shown you, but also may generate uh, pendeluft, may decrease the alveolar pressure, which generate uh, this uh, self-inflicted lung injury. Although, of course, it's not voluntary from the patient's standpoint, but it's related to this increased drive and it enters a vicious circle. It may also be important to monitor respiratory function from the diaphragm standpoint. So not only to protect the lung, but also to protect the diaphragm. I'm, this is a, a bit complicated slide, but it shows that uh, there are many reasons why uh, explaining why the diaphragm, so which is the most important muscle for respiration, uh, may be injured or may become weak in the ICU. Um, there are reasons related to the respiratory failure itself, to the presence of inappropriate effort, either too low or too high, which can be um, induced by mechanical ventilation and sedation, or by itself the sepsis can induce uh, injury to the muscle and the denutrition, which often occur in the ICU. So to try to prevent this very high incidence of diaphragm weakness, uh, maybe targeting a, a normal level of effort in, under assisted ventilation may be important. We uh, are now more and more uh, aware of the, the risk for this muscle. Uh, so it has been called here by Johan Golliger the diaphragmatic myotrauma, um, which may have different uh, reasons. One may be and this may be the most frequent, the over-assistance myotrauma. If you don't let the diaphragm work sufficiently, the diaphragm will rapidly atrophy. At the opposite, you may have under-assistance myotrauma, which means uh, you don't uh, give enough assistance and do not unload the, the muscle enough. Or you have also this case associated with some asynchrony like eccentric myotrauma, which I discussed in another presentation on reverse triggering, for instance. And uh, we have many studies showing that uh, the respiratory muscles are more susceptible to damage, injury, and atrophy than other muscles, 
Um, I, I picked up one of them because it's very nice clinical study in septic patients. And they uh, had a 3D reconstruction uh, from a CT scan of the size of the diaphragm. And they compared sepsis and no, no sepsis patients. But they also compared the diaphragm to other muscle like the psoas, for instance. And the diaphragm was clearly um, more sensitive in the fact that the mass of the diaphragm uh, significantly decreased more than the other muscles. So one of uh, the reasons for that may be that uh, uh, we keep the patients very often sedated and without uh, assisted uh, sufficient spontaneous breathing. And to try to visualize this, we did a, a, a relatively complicated study in, um, at St. Mike's where we put an electrical activity of the diaphragm catheter in every patient at time of intubation. And we wanted to know, and we, we have been uh, following like 70 patients. We wanted to know what is the time to get to a minimal resumption of diaphragmatic activity, which in our study was like seven microvolts of EDI, which correspond maybe to 15% of thickening fraction. And you see that on average, it's close to one day, 24 hours, before any activity can be observed. And for some patients, it can be more than 48 hours and even some patients after five days do not recover their activity. So we say, what are the reasons for explaining a late resumption of diaphragmatic activity? And no surprise, we found that sedation has a very important role. So this is a comparison of patients with uh, minimal sedation versus continuous IV sedation. And you see that the time for resumption is very, very different. And probably as a consequence of that, the use of assisted ventilation early on versus controlled ventilation. So you could say, well, this is no surprise. What was really surprising to us was that there, there was absolutely no relationship with patient severity or reason for intubation. So it seems it's related to clinicians' behavior and maybe clinicians' response to something. Uh, like maybe agitation or, or, or asynchrony, and that probably we can avoid that. So to avoid that, we would need to monitor drive and effort. And the good news is we have the tools to do that. Um, I showed you the possibility to monitor the electrical activity of the diaphragm. But a very simple tool which measures not the effort but the drive is the occlusion pressure, the P01, which is available now on all ventilators. And you have an example of patients with a high drive, so P.1 would be close to four centimeters of water, and the patient with very low drive, where the P.1 would be below one centimeter of water. And why monitoring drive is, is important or interesting? Well, because you may detect not only over assistance, which means very high drive, but also under assistance, uh, sorry, um, not only over, and over uh, activity, but also under activity. And in fact, the P.1 is very, very good to detect that your patient is not doing enough. You see here uh, what we call P.1 reference or P.1 measure by the ventilator was very good to detect minimal level of effort, which are insufficient to keep the diaphragm working. And every time you have a P.1 below one, it may be a warning sign telling you, well, your patient is over assisted or over sedated. Of course, for high effort, Individually, it may vary a bit more between patients, but something like more than 3.5 or 4 should be an alert to say, well, maybe my patient is working too high. Uh, another index to check that the patient is high, maybe just to do an occlusion at the end of expiration. Then you will see this negative pressure swing, 
And from this negative pressure string, you can calculate how much a patient is doing. So we have tools which are on every ventilator, which can, which can tell you, well, my patient is not working enough. I give too much assistance or too much sedation, or maybe my patient is working too much and the uh, level of sedation maybe should be increased. Um, it, are there something we can do to optimize effort? Yes, uh, there are a lot of things you can do on the vent without even going to the sedation. If, if sedation, uh, for instance, is not the problem, you can adjust the peak flow on the ventilator. You can, of course, adjust the support level. You can adjust the PEEP level, which is uh, frequently ignored, but important determinant of patient's effort. Uh, you can adjust the FIU to slightly even without going to hyperoxemia. Uh, if you're on the low side, increasing FIU2 may help. You can switch to a proportional mode, which uh, very often is a nice way for the patient to, to give control to the patient on the level of uh, effort. And of course, if you need, you can go to sedation. So we have the tools to do it. We have the techniques to modify the effort. So I think we should monitor respiratory effort, for instance, by using P.1 and the occlusion, the P.O.C., the total occlusion pressure, uh, plus other tools like, uh, like the electrical activity of the diaphragm or the driving pressure if you use proportional assist ventilation. And this is the a uh, necessary first step to be able to target both the lung and the diaphragm protective ventilation. So these are complex issues. If you need to go back to um, the, uh, the techniques for all these uh, measurements, which are not complicated, please visit our blog, coemv.ca and which will offer you videos and explanation for these important tools at the bedside. Thank you very much.